the periodic table allows me to do the same thing. So, let's move forward a little bit and then we'll come back. This is uh, another way for you to kind of look at the periodic table, breaking it down by blocks. So, the first two columns are the S block, and that's here in green. That's the S block, the first two columns. Right, the, the S block is two columns wide because I can fit two electrons in an S subshell. This block over here is six columns wide because it's the P block. So the P block, six columns wide because a P subshell can hold up to six electrons. The D block here is separating the S block and the P block and it can hold ten electrons which is why it's ten atoms wide. And then the F block is down here. Really, it shouldn't be down here. And when people look at the periodic table, they think of these two rows of elements as maybe being different from the rest in some way. They're not really different. The only reason that this group of elements is separated from the others is because if we put it in here where it belongs, it would make it too wide to fit on a normal piece of paper. And if you look on any periodic table right here in this region, you'll see a note, some type of notation on your periodic table that says, once you get to barium, the next element is here. 56, 57. 57 through 71. Then I come back up to 72. So really, this should be, I should cut this, slide this over, and insert these two columns right here and push everything else over. Then it would look like this. But then it's just really long and I've got all these gaps and it's just difficult to fit on a piece of paper. So that's why you don't really see the periodic table written like that. But you can use the periodic table, if you remember that this is inserted here, you can use the periodic table to give an electron configuration. So if we look at calcium, the one we just did, calcium, rid of this. If we start at the top, left hand side with the first element, that's an S block element. And really helium should be over here because it's also an S block element. The only reason it's not here is because it shares properties in common with the other noble gases. But helium is an S block element. It has two electrons in the S. Right? So this also, as I go down each row, I have a number, one, two, three, etc. This number on the left hand side tells me what energy level the electrons are in on the outside as I continue to fill the, that atom in with electrons. So this is the first row and it's the S block. So I start with 1S. So I would fill in 1S. There's really, since helium should be over here, there's two elements to fill in that first 1S block. Then once I go there, I go to the next row. So I'm going to just go across the periodic table from the top to the bottom all the way across each row. So after I go across the top row, I go to the second row. This is also in the S block. And there's two elements. So that means I can, I can put two more electrons in the S, the 2S. So now I'm the second, second row down, so it's 2S, and I've got two elements in the S block. Then if I continue, I'm skipping everything, and I go over to the P block. And again, it's a second row down, so now I'm in the 2P. And since there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 elements over, I can put up to 6 electrons in the 2P. Once I finish off the 2P, I go down to the next row. Now I'm in the S block again, and it's a 3S. So I have a 3S2, two columns in the S block, means I have two maximum number of electrons there. Once I finish that off, then I'm still staying in the same row. Now I'm in the P block again, and I'm in the third row down, so that's 3P. All the way over to the sixth element. I keep going till I find the element I'm interested in. So once I fill up the 3P, I keep going, then calcium is the second element over in the 4S block. Fourth energy level, S block, second element over, so it has two electrons in the 4S. So I end up with the same configuration if I do it that way. So you don't really need 
you don't really need this. All you need to do is remember this is the S block, the P block, the D block, the F block, and then just follow the periodic table until you get to the element you're interested in. So let's look at a couple more examples to illustrate that. So here we have um, uh, also a way of abbreviating electron configurations. So I don't always have to start from the very beginning. And this, I mean, let's say we wanted to do the electron configuration of mercury. This has 80 electrons. If I start from the beginning, I go 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, etc. I have to write out all 80 electrons. It would take me forever. Plus, since most of those electrons in the atom are really close to the nucleus, held very tightly by the 80 protons attracting them in the nucleus, they're not going anywhere in any real life reaction I'm, or change that mercury might un undergo. When we talk later, we'll find out that it's the outer electron, the ones that are farthest away from the nucleus that are held most loosely, that may be shared with another atom or lost or er an area where more electrons may be gained. It's the outer electrons we're most interested in. So we can abbreviate on electron configuration. So instead of starting from the beginning and going across every single row until we get to the element, we can start from the element and just go back to the nearest noble gas and start from there. And so if I write a symbol, like this example on the slide, these 18 electrons here are the same 18 electrons if I started from the beginning and made to argon. So writing argon in, parent in a bracket is the same as writing this configuration. It's just an abbreviation for that configuration showing those 18 electrons. So if I wanted to give the configuration for potassium, instead of going back to the beginning and writing everything out, I can start from potassium and just go back one element to the first noble gas I reach working backwards. I find argon, I write that in brackets, that's representing the inner electrons of the atom that aren't going to be likely to be going in, undergoing any change anyway. So I start from there and then I work forward. Potassium is the next element. It's in the fourth row down. It's in the S block. It's the first element in. So 4S1. So that would be my abbreviated electron configuration. Much easier to write. Takes a lot less time than writing the full, the full, uh, the full configuration. So I'm not sure why this is here. <laughs> They're just introducing a couple new terms. The transition metals are the D block elements. And then the, they have special names for the F block elements. We're not going to really be working with them too much. So I'm not going to expect you to know those names. But you should know FPD and F blocks. You should know if which block an element is in if I give you an element. Because it's helpful in writing the electron configuration. So let's do mercury. So you've got mercury. I'm not going to ask you to write the full electron configuration starting from 1s because it's going to take too long. But maybe I want the abbreviated one. So you start from mercury, which is element 80. You go back until you get back to the nearest noble gas, which is xenon. So you'd start with xenon in brackets. That symbol represents the first 54 inner electrons of the mercury. So in that short amount of time, we just wrote the electron configuration for the first 54 electrons. Then beyond xenon, if I follow the periodic table, the next element is in the sixth row down in the S block. So I've got two columns there, so I would start with 6S2. Oops, here. 6S2. Once I finish the 6S2, then I have to recognize this is where the F block should be inserted. So once I fill the 6S2, I have to go now to the F block. And there are 14 columns in the F block. So that's 4F14. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Make sure you recognize that for the F block, it is inserted here. It's inserted into the sixth row down. That doesn't mean this is 6F. It's 4F and 5F. So you should recognize that 
The F subshell doesn't exist until you get to the fourth energy level. That's the first energy level that has an F subshell. So the first F subshell should be the 4F. And the next one should be the 5F. Same, similar situation with the D block. Even though the D block starts on the fourth row down, this is not 4D, it's 3D. So 3D, 4D, 5D, 6D. So again, since the D subshell doesn't exist in energy level one or two, the first energy level that has a D subshell is the third energy level. So the first D block is the 3D, it's the third energy level D subshell. So anyway, I fill up the 4F, 4F14, that gets me here, to element 71. Then I come back over here. Now I'm in the D block. And it's the 3, 4, 5, the 5D block. So after the 4F14, I fill in the 5D10. That gets me to the end of the D block, that's Mercury. If I were doing gold, well, gold is a bit of an exception, so I won't. Uh, mention that one. If I were doing iridium, I wouldn't have a 5D10 because iridium is only the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th element over in the D block. So if I were doing iridium, everything would be the same, but I would have a 5D7. So yeah, I'll just put that on here. Questions about that? So you should be able to give an abbreviated electron configuration for any element following that logic. There are four exceptions I expect you to know. There are actually lots of exceptions. If you follow these blocks and follow the periodic table and use this method, you'll get it wrong for a lot of the elements because a lot of them are exceptions. You'll get it right for any of the ones I'll ask you. So use this method and you'll be okay. The only exceptions I expect you to know are chromium and molybdenum and copper and silver. And the reason that the book covers those and not the other exceptions is because the reason behind these exceptions is also something we'll see later in the, in the semester, especially next chapter. So <clears throat> there are a few observations chemists have made that tell us that there's something especially stable when a subshell is either exactly full or exactly half full. Right. So if I have a subshell, like maybe the 2P, and the 2P has three orbitals. The elements that exactly half fill that up, which is nitrogen, and the element that have that exactly full, which is neon, have slightly more stability than you would expect. Especially when it's completely full or when an energy level is completely full, like neon. So, because it's a little bit extra stable to have a half fill or a completely full subshell, elements that are almost half full or almost completely full can arrange their electrons a little bit differently from normal to achieve that situation where it's exactly half full or, or, or almost completely or exactly half full or completely full. So, looking at chromium, what we would expect to see is this. If we looked at chromium, element 24, and drew its abbreviated electron configuration, we would go back to the nearest noble gas, argon. We'd start from argon, we'd move forward from argon to potassium. So it's the fourth column down, it's the F block, we have a 4S2, and then chromium's the one, two, three, fourth element over, so it should be 3D4. But the 3D can hold 10 maximum. Having four electrons out of ten possible is not a stable number. It's not necessarily an unstable number, but what we observe is if we exactly fill ten out of ten in a D subshell or exactly half fill five out of ten in a D subshell, that will be slightly more stable. 
So this is not the correct electron configuration, even though it's predicted based on the method we just saw. It's an exception that you need to know, because in this particular exception, because the um, 4s and 3d are pretty similar in energy, electrons can pop back and forth without much of an energy cost. So normally we fill the 4s first with slightly lower in energy, but just slightly. And since it's just slightly lower in energy, it's actually more stable to take one of the force electrons out, so I only have one left, and put that electron into the 3D so it's exactly half full. So the stability that's gained by making that 3D exactly half full is more than the stability that's lost by taking an electron out of the 4S, which is where it would normally go. And if I look at the element below chromium on the periodic table, molybdenum, oops, molybdenum, it's the same way, except molybdenum, the previous noble gas, is cr krypton. And then when we go from krypton, we're now in the 5S and the 4D. But it's the same situation. Instead of filling the 5S with two electrons and then only having four electrons for the 4D want to fill the 4D exactly half full and so one of the electrons from the 5S will pop into the 4D and I'll get that electron configuration. So this is the correct electron configuration for chromium and molybdenum due to the fact that having a subshell exactly half full is slightly more stable. So because the 3D and the 4S are similar in energy, an electron pops into the, the D subshell from the S to make it exactly half full. So this is what we get, greater stability for chromium to make it exactly half full. And we know because chromium has more magnetic properties than we would expect due to having so many unpaired electrons creating magnetic fields that all add together. Um, if you look at copper and silver, they would normally be predicted to have nine out of ten electrons because there's the ninth element over in that D block. But 9 out of 10 is not a stable, especially stable number. Half full or completely full is what makes it especially stable. So instead of having 9 out of 10, we take one electron, which would normally be in the 4S, put it into the 3D so that the 3D is exactly full and the 4S is half full. It really doesn't make the 4S unstable to do that because if the 4S has 4S2, it's completely full. If it's 4S1, it's half full. So either of those is a fairly stable situation. So instead of copper being 4s2, 3d9, it ends up being 4s1, 3d10. Similar situation for silver. So silver would be krypton, and then 5s1, 4d10. So that one electron from the 5s would move into the 4d so that that could be completely full. So those are the four exceptions that you need to know. Any questions about those? All right, let's just do a little extra practice, especially since we're going to have an exam on this on Thursday. So in this question here, we have an atom arsenic with 33 electrons. We want to write the electron configuration. So if we want to write the abbreviated, well, if we want to write the full electron configuration, we'd have to start with 1s. We'd go across each row on the periodic table. But if we want the abbreviated, we'd start with argon. Because from arsenic, we have to work back to the nearest noble gas, not forward. So we have to go back from arsenic. The closest noble gas going backwards is argon. So we'd start with argon. And then we work forward from that. The next element is in the 4S block, so 4S2. Then, after that's full, we go to the D block, and that's the 3D10, getting us closer to arsenic. Then arsenic is the 1, 2, 3, third element over in the P block, and that's the fourth row down. So it's the 4P, 
Third element in means there are three electrons in the 4p. Want to check our work though. Make sure that the number of electrons adds up. Arsenic should have 33 electrons if it's neutral. 33 electrons total. So if I add the 18 that argon represents, plus the 2 in the 4s, plus 10 in the 3d, plus 3 in the 4p, that gets me to 33. So I know that at least I have a chance that it could be correct. Questions about that? All right, there's a couple in the textbook that I want to look at. It really hopefully help solidify this. So if you look at 3.93, explain the meaning of the symbol 4D6. What is the meaning of that? It means there are six electrons in the 4D subshell. So if we wanted to show that, one, two, well, that wasn't very good. Try that again. So the 4D subshell has five orbitals. And if there are six electrons, I would fill them in, starting with the same spin, one in each orbital, and then I'd put one more pair up. So that's what 4D6 means. It's just showing us where the, what, how many electrons there are in the 4D subshell. Um, 3.98. Determine the maximum number of electrons that can be found in each of the following subshells. So I wanted to mention this one to reiterate that the maximum number of electrons in a subshell is independent of what energy level the subshell is in. It just depends on the type of subshell you're dealing with. Any S subshell can hold a maximum of two. Right? That's why there are two columns in the S block. Any P subshell can hold a maximum of six. There are six columns in the P block. A D subshell holds a maximum of 10 electrons, and an F subshell holds a maximum of 14 electrons. Whether 4F, 5F, 2000F, if it's an F, it holds 14 electrons max. Uh, 104. So, 104, you're asked to determine the number of unpaired electrons, assuming that you have a ground state configuration, and then determine if it's diamagnetic or paramagnetic. There's a few different skills we need for this, so we'll look at a couple uh, examples here. So, if we look at A, that's carbon. We actually, we did carbon already uh, during lecture, so let me just skip that one. Um, move on to B. So, sulfur. Sulfur. <coughs> Uh, so if you look at the electron configurations, the only elements that are diamagnetic are the ones that have completely filled subshells. Right? So let's say I have to fill up an S subshell. It doesn't matter whether it's 1S, 2S. If it's not completely full, it's going to have an unpaired electron because they would have only one of, out of two places filled. So that's not going to be diamagnetic because that one electron is going to create a magnetic field. It's not going to be canceled out. To make it diamagnetic, it has to be full. Same thing for a P subshell. If it's not full, it's not going to have all the electrons paired. Once I put one electron in, doesn't matter where I put it, that's not paired. The next electron is going to spread out with the same spin keep spreading them out. Then I start to pair them up and they don't all get paired until the subshell is completely full. And I do get the same thing with the D or an F subshell. So what that means is very few of the elements in their ground states are actually non-magnetic. Only the elements that have a full subshell. So you can find those quickly on the periodic table. The elements in column two are the elements with a full S subshell. Those elements are all diamagnetic or non-magnetic. The elements in column 8, A. The end of the P block. The elements at the end of each block, those are the elements that have a full subshell. So these elements have a full P subshell, except helium has a full S. This row, or this column I should say, they have a full D. And then here I've got a full F. 
although there's weird stuff happening there, so those are exceptions. Yes? So a 4D6 would not, would not, would be paramagnetic. Right. So 4D6, because it's not full, and these electrons are spreading out with the same spin, means it, it has to be paramagnetic. It can't, it has to have some magnetic properties if I've got magnetic fields created by those spinning electrons that are not canceled out. So looking at sulfur, it's not at the end of its block. It has to be paramagnetic. And I can prove that by showing 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. And then when I get to the 3p, it's the fourth element over. So if I look at what's going on in the 3p, I've got four electrons to put in there. One, two, three, four. I've got two unpaired electrons. So even though sulfur has an even number of electrons, and they could be paired up, since there's an even number of them, they will not be paired up because of Hund's rule. Because to be in the ground state, they spread out first, and then they start pairing up if I put electrons in. They won't be totally paired, they won't be diamagnetic until you get to the end of a block where the subshell is completely full. So, <coughs> sulfur is paramagnetic and it has two unpaired electrons. What about copper? Copper is one of the exceptions we needed to know. In copper we said one of the four S electrons is going to move in here and fill up the 3D. So the 3D will be full and everything will be paired, but I'll have one electron in the 4S. That means that it's one unpaired electron and it's paramagnetic. Um, lead. Lead is here. So all of the core electrons are all filled up their energy levels. Once I get past xenon, I fill up the 6s. They're paired. I move from the 6s down here. I fill up the, the 4f. That should pair up all the electrons. Then I move here. I fill up the 3, 4, 5D. That should be all paired up. And then I've got two electrons in the 6P. So everything's full and paired, but I've got two electrons in the 6P. Will the two electrons in the 6P be paired? No, not if it's in the ground state. They have to spread out into different orbitals with the same spin. So it should be paramagnetic with two unpaired electrons. Um, yeah, so that pretty much covers that topic, I think. Any questions about that? Yes? Which example? Is that from the chapter, the end of the chapter? Okay, we'll go back to that. This one? Yeah, sure. So, this element, calcium, is at the end of its block. So it is diamagnetic. It does have all its electrons paired up. So if we wanted to show that, we have the 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s. So my, th it's really messy, I apologize. Uh, my p subshells have three blocks because there's three orbitals. My s subshells have one s because, one block because there's, or one square because there's one orbital. So I fill my two electrons in close to the nucleus first, fill that up, fill that up, fill this, then I pair, gets completely full, all the electrons are paired up. Then I move to the 3s. I fill that up. Then I move to the 3p. Each orbital has one electron. I still have more electrons to put in, so I pair them up. And then I get to the 4s, and I've got two electrons, so they pair. So when all the electrons are paired, it's diamagnetic or non-magnetic. What? Yeah, that's for the ground state, right. So if I, if I make an excited state, it's not going to be diamagnetic anymore. If I take any one of these electrons 
and move them to a higher energy level, then they're not all going to be paired up anymore. So at that point, it would be paramagnetic. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, just a <coughs> couple more quick examples. Should drive this home so that you guys can feel confident about it. So if you look at 3.106, camera on here so we can look these together. Oh, yeah. in. Okay. So here is three point one oh six. We want to know Which of these violate the Pauli exclusion principle and Hund's rule? So if we look at A here, is that violating anything? Yeah, so on the exam, I'd probably be more likely to ask you ground, excited, or impossible. So how would you classify A? Impossible. Violates the Pauli exclusion principle, so it's impossible. All right, good. What about B? B is ground. Right? So I've got these three here. Actually, no, it is excited. I apologize. I didn't see the spins exactly precisely. Oh, I have to move that. Okay, so um, these two electrons here have different spins. That's what makes it violate Hund's rule. So when I'm going to put multiple electrons in a subshell, the single ones that aren't paired up yet should have the same spin to be a ground state. If they have different spins, then it's excited. So that violates Hund's rule. It does not violate Pauli's exclusion principle, so it's not impossible, it's just excited. Good, what about C? C is the ground state because C has all the unpaired electrons with the same spin, and then I had one more to put in, so I paired it up in the middle. It doesn't matter whether I paired it up in the middle or the right or the left. It's still ground state. What about D? D is excited. Good. E. Excited, right, because this electron spinning the other direction from the other unpaired ones, that makes it excited, violating Hund's rule. Just so you know, D is violating uh, Hund's rule as well. What about F? Yeah, you got to look closely. These two are spinning in the same direction, the same orbital, so it's definitely impossible violating Good. Uh, 3.113. Comment on the correctness, which I didn't know was a word, of the following statement. Maybe it's a word, probably is. The statement is the probability of finding two electrons with the same four quantum numbers in an atom is zero. Is that correct? Yes. Two electrons in the same atom with the same four quantum numbers would mean that those two electrons are in the same orbital with the same spin, and that cannot happen. So the probability of that is zero. 